accredited by the New England Association of Schools and Colleges. Bay Path University is a leader in education and offers a wide array of degrees that are focused on some of the most emergent careers, such as the MFA in creative nonfiction, of course, higher education, genetic counseling, leadership and negotiation, cybersecurity management, and many, many more. A Bay Path University education empowers undergraduate women and graduate women and men to become leaders in their careers and communities with an innovative approach to learning that prepares students to flourish in a constantly changing world. Our over 30 online and on-ground graduate programs are perfect for the professionals and the pragmatists, for women and men juggling families and full-time jobs. In fact, 90% of our students work and attend graduate school at the same time. You are able to do so because we make your education as accessible and manageable as possible. And if you ask a Bay Path woman undergraduate to define her academic experience, it would be one word, transformational. But we also educate the whole person, giving our women the courage and confidence to be their best self. It's why women's education still matters. At Bay Path University, students receive a great deal of personal attention through the admissions process and during their experience as a student. Our professors are both practitioners and faculty and bring a wealth of knowledge and expertise to the classroom. In addition, they are committed to giving our students the best support and encouragement throughout their experience at Bay Path. Again, thank you for joining us today. And now it is my pleasure to turn the presentation over to Leanna and Lisa. Welcome. Hi, this is Lisa. Welcome, Lisa. Hi, Leanna. Nice to be here. I see we both got the memo about the blue glasses in the photo. Excellent. Leanna, can you hear us? Yes, I absolutely can. Hello, and I'm here. Delighted to welcome you, Lisa. And to jump right into our conversation, we have so much to talk about today. Um, I want to start with commenting, Lisa, on the title of your talk, and especially the Don't Give Up message, because I think many, many writers, and I see this all the time in the MFA and those who are thinking about it, struggle with exactly that, you know, how to keep going when so much in life seems to conspire to drag writers away from their work, or worse, to suggest that their writing isn't important. There's a popular fantasy, which I admit sharing to a certain extent, of the writer alone in a remote cabin for a year in perfect solitude, snow falling gently outside the window, or if it were me, waves lapping. Um, but I think that's happened maybe twice in my life. And this is <laughs> yeah, it's unrealistic. <laughs> Right? It's pretty rare for most of us um, when we have jobs and family responsibilities and bills to pay. So the big question is when and how to write, but your title suggests that it's possible to fulfill the dream of finishing a book without the luxury of retreating from the world. So that leads to my first question, which is multi-part. So please uh, answer in your own time and in any order you want. But I'd like to focus first on, could you please tell us about a little at a time? You have a very busy life as a writing teacher and a coach and an editor and our MFA thesis director, a spouse and a parent, and now you have a new book out and you're marketing and touring for the book. I want to know how on earth did you carve out the precious time to write in the middle of all that? and not lose faith during the years it took to complete your book. And by the way, I'm not suggesting that this office looks like yours. <laughs> <laughs> that was gonna be the first thing I was gonna say was that is not my office. <laughs> but it, it does suggest, and the reason I chose this slide is because it does suggest the pile of things that can sometimes fall on us as writers with all these other things going on. So please, Tell us about yours, Lisa. Sure. 
Uh, now, that's not to say my office doesn't sometimes resemble parts of that, um, but it's not like that all the time. My mind resembles that. <laughs> so, but one thing I just wanted to say right off the bat was one of the big things that I see um, getting in writer's way is what I call self-rejection right out of the gate. Um, hmm. People reject their own ideas before they even have a chance to bring them to fruition. They tell themselves that's not going to be a good book or a good article or who wants to read that or, oh, my gosh, by the time I finish and get it published, I might be 50 or however many years old. And well, guess what? You're going to be that age anyway. Wouldn't it be nice to be that age and have your book or other project done? So um, I, I really like to let people know, try not to reject yourself before the world has even had a chance to reject you because trust me, there's gonna be plenty of that rejection when you do start moving your work out into the world. So don't do it to yourself right from the get-go. You have an idea, you have something you think is worthwhile, go for it. Give yourself the opportunity to develop it first um, before rejecting yourself. So I think that's one hurdle people mm -hmm. have to get over, particularly when you're not, you know, in your 20s and you maybe feel like, gee, life's going on. Should I really devote years of my life to this? So try it first. Try it on. Work on it. See if you like working on it. That's another thing I say to people, too, is one of the great advantages of working on your book a little bit at a time is you actually find out if you like the topic. Um, I've actually seen people have a great idea for a book. It, to them, it seems like a good idea and they're passionate about it. And then they start getting into the actual work of it and they realize, you know what? I don't want to write two or 3,000 words about this. I don't really want to write 80 or 100,000 words about this topic. And isn't it great to find that out as you go along? Mm. Um, because a book is a big commitment. It's a lot of words, number one, just on a volume basis. You're going to produce a lot of words. So it's much better to think of that in small chunks that you can manage. You know, can you write 80,000 words? Well, that seems huge. But if you think about, well, what if I took three or four years to do that? And what if I did, so that means maybe I'm only going to write 15 or 20,000 words a year. And then you keep dividing it up and you eventually come to something like, you know, 500 words a day, let's say. And, you know, there's a famous expression, I forget who said it now, I should know, um, a page a day is a book a year. Mm -hmm. Now that's a little exaggerated. You know, most people can't write a page every day for 365 days in a row. But the point is well taken that even a huge project breaks down into smaller steps. It's a page. Can you write a page? That's all. Just write the page. Tomorrow you worry about the next page or the next time you have an opportunity to sit down to write. Um, I think that the best advice is not to take cookie cutter advice. There's a lot of advice out there in the writing world, and it sounds very rigid. Uh, you must write every single day if you're going to be a writer. You must write a page a day. You must write a thousand words a day. You must do this. You must do that. And I don't think any of that works for adults who have jobs, careers, families, uh, volunteer or organizational uh, 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 duties, taking care of elderly parents, maybe whatever makes up your full adult life, you probably can't then adopt this cookie cutter advice. You have to do it the other way around, which is let me look at my life and let me figure out there are certain things in my life I must do, certain things I have to do, certain things I want to do, and I also want to write. So how can I make this all work? Mm -hmm. So one way is not to put so much pressure on yourself, number one. If you don't write today, it doesn't mean you're not a writer anymore. You know, if you're a plumber and you don't fix any pipes today, it doesn't mean you're not a plumber anymore. So, <laughs> so take a look, really take a look and say, what could I do? How could I make what I call a regular writing commitment? doesn't have to be daily. What can I do regularly? 
And, you know, it's going to be different for everybody. For some people, I'll give you some examples of some writers I've worked with. Um, I have one client who writes on the train on the way to work every morning. He has a tiny little netbook computer. There's no internet on it. She takes that with her in her handbag. She pulls it out every morning, and for 45 minutes, she writes on the way into work. And sometimes, if she's not too tired, she'll write on the way home on the train. But that's not... Uh, that that's not a commitment she has to do for her in her mind the morning is her writing time so she gets that four or five mornings a week mm. um, you know that works for her it fits into her life um, and you have to ask yourself what fits into mine so somebody else might choose to go to a cafe three or four days a week on her lunch hour someone else might um, you know depending on your home life Make a deal with the people you live with and say, you know what? You guys are going to cook and eat dinner on your own two nights a week because I need those two hours I'm going to write. Maybe you do something on the weekend. You trade off chores or things like that. You know, when my kids were little, uh, they're 20 and 24 now, but when they were little, I remember sitting in the bleachers at their sporting events and with my notebook and I'd be writing. Because the truth of the matter is, if a kid's playing baseball and they're eight years old, you really only have to watch for a certain number of minutes. You have to watch when they're, you have to watch when they're up at bat and cheer them on, and you have to watch when they're in the outfield and a ball comes their way. Other than that, it's two and a half hours of time, and you know you could spend that time having lovely conversation with the other parents. But you could also have your notebook on your lap. So you have to look at what little pockets of time you might have available. It may not all come in one big chunk. It may not be that retreat over a weekend or, you know, two hours every single day of lovely uninterrupted time when nobody needs you. You may have to carve it up a little bit more and sneak that time in. Another uh, thing I remember when my kids were younger, and I'm sure, you know, who knows, some of the other moms probably thought I was a snob, but here's the thing. In my town, you had to get to the place to get on a line to pick your kids up at the carpool line at the school. You had to get there like 35, 40 minutes in advance to get a spot online without, otherwise you might as well have just parked at home two miles away. So I go there and I park and all the other moms would get out of the car and talk to one another. And I did that for a while and then I thought, you know what, 30 minutes times five days a week, that's two and a half hours I could be writing in my car. So, you know, I didn't get to socialize as much as maybe I wanted to, but for three, four days a week, I sat in the car with the notebook. So these are the kinds of things that I encourage people to think about. I know exactly what you mean about the grabbing moments whenever you can. Just one little note, Lisa. Um, we've had a comment about volume. So if we can just bring it down even a little bit more, that would be super helpful. Thank you so much. Um, hey, I will move away from the microphone. Yeah, you. I think you have an, a, a, a world-class microphone, <laughs> which is really, it's good. Well, one um, of those kids who's now a computer nerd in college set up my computer, so that could be. <laughs> Oh, that could be part of it. Yeah, it could be down just a little bit or maybe sit a little bit um, away from it. Um, you got it. Uh, thank you. You know, I used to think that I had to, you know, thinking about the fragmented nature of some of this um, writing process, that unless I could shut the door and go deep, deep into it for hours at a time, it wasn't worth picking up at all. And I found that not to be the case. And so I understand exactly what you mean. Um, waiting in line sometimes, even whipping out a notebook while waiting in a long line at a grocery store. Um, I've had ideas come to me. And sometimes I find that just if I have 10 minutes, taking a look at what I've written the day before and reminding myself of it and sending it back through my mind has helped with that as well. So I'm I absolutely um, agree. And I, I get that idea some people do feel that I really need time to sink into the work. Um, however, there are certain things, you, certain things you can and can't do in those small pockets of time. 
Mm-hmm. Um, let's say you're you're doing some dialogue and you're working on it, and you've had two or three different drafts of this dialogue exchange in the middle of your book or whatever, and it's not really working out, and it's a sticking point. Well, you can carry that around with you while you're grocery shopping, while you're jogging, while you're you know driving somewhere, and and as you say, and then sometimes it untangles itself for you. So mm-hmm. the point then is to have some place to capture that. Have a notebook in your car, in your purse, in your gym bag. Have a note-taking application on your phone. Uh, or just dictate yourself uh, a draft in an email on your phone. Some way to capture that because the writer's brain is always working. And sometimes the solution to a writing challenge comes to you not when you're at the keyboard. Mm-hmm. Um, One little trick I learned from someone is before, when you do have a writing session, like a good satisfying writing session where you're you're at your keyboard for an hour, two, three hours, right before you leave that, ask yourself, what can I work on just mentally while I'm away from this? What do I want to contemplate? What do I want to mull? And maybe it's, well, what do the characters do next in the next chapter? Or how should this person react to this? Or What are the things I need to research in order to write this next section? And just take that away from you before you close your keyboard and it'll just bounce around in your mind. And you might then, that might be the thing that you can work on when you do find those small little pockets of time. I like what you say about it will untangle itself for you. And I've had that experience many times. Um, Often if I just review before going to sleep what I've written, and um, I might actually even give myself a kind of um, mental suggestion, you know, to think about it while I'm sleeping, to think about it when I wake up in the morning. And uh, I've had the experience of sometimes dreaming a solution. And- oh, yeah. That, that, especially that state where you're sort of dreaming, but you're sort of aware that you're dreaming. Mm-hmm. And that's why you need the notebook next to the bed. Uh, one of my sons brought me a pen that has a flashlight on the bottom of it. So when you click the pen on, the light comes on so you can take those notes next to your bed. And then there's some hope of being able to read them in the morning. I need this pen. I have not seen this. I need this pen. It's a $10 I- miracle. I need it. I have a journal as well that I grab as soon as I wake up, um, even if I spend five minutes in it. And I I just, I don't even have to write whole sentences. I can just jot down little fragments. I find that that helps with the same thing that you're talking about, about helping these things untangle themselves. So I want to move on to the next question. Lisa, you know, this book was, you've worked so hard and it was a long time coming. Were there ever moments when you started to lose faith? And if so, how did you get yourself back on track again? Yeah, I put the book away for probably a year and a half, maybe two years, because I was just kind of frustrated with the way things were going. Mm -hmm. Um, So uh, if I could just digress for one moment, just a little tiny bit of how the book evolved, because I know you were planning to ask me about that later, but it actually has to do with this question here. Yes, it let's started go. as a bunch of essays. I was writing all these different essays, all related to the same theme of grief and getting to know my father. And at one point I thought, oh, this is going to be a linked essay collection. They're all going to be thematically related, but separate essays. Uh, and I started to submit that. And all the feedback I got, both from publishers and from some other authors I asked to take a look, was that, you know, this would work much better as a more traditional linear narrative memoir. Mm. And in the grand tradition of many, many writers I know, I decided, oh, no, I know better. (laughs) And this is what I want to do. (laughs) Feedback be damned. So at that point, I got very frustrated and put it away because I really, really wanted to have an essay collection. And and I was not sure I wanted to write a more traditional memoir. So I did put it away. Um, I wouldn't say that I was, you know, lost faith or anything like that. I just thought, you know what, this project isn't going to work out the way I want it to. So I'm going to put it away and I'm going to write something else, Hmm. which I think is also very typical 
for a lot of writers who are making their way toward their first book. Uh, so I just so I put that whole idea of the essay collection. I put all the essays aside, and I thought, I'll write something else. And I I started on a manuscript on eating disorder. I started on a manuscript on postpartum depression. I have all these happy happy things to write about in my life. So <laughs> anyway, um, but neither of those really grabbed me that much. And I, so I went back to the manuscript and I thought, okay, now it's time. And I pulled all the essays apart to see what could be salvaged. And then I started writing again from the beginning to that really became this book, which was in January of 2016 is when I sat down to start that. So there's always gonna be a point. I mean, I've seen this in so many writers I've worked with as an editor and a coach and just writer friends that I have there's always going to be a point at which you go, oh, it's not working. And it doesn't have to be that it was rejected or the feedback wasn't good. It could also just be that, oh, I'm not finding um, the research to support my uh, my thesis. Or can you hear me okay? Mm. No, when you, when you went back to it, Lisa, did you find that you then wanted to turn it into a, a more traditional memoir. In other words, did putting it aside give you time to think about it in a different way and get you excited about that, as opposed to thinking, well, I've got to do this? I don't know if I was excited at the beginning. I was challenged. You know, as a writer, I thought, I have to find out if I can do this. This is what I'm getting as, as um, advice. And why not try it? Why not see if I can do it? Let me see if I'm up to the challenge. It's going to be hard. And I want to test myself and see if I can actually pull this off. So that was kind of my mindset going into that. It was more like, okay, this is what's got to be done. I'm going to see if I can actually do this now. And then once I had the chronological bookend, so to speak, once I decided okay, we're going to start three months before my father's death and the book's going to end three years later. Once I knew that, then I was able to think about how to lay out the narrative line. And, and even though there's a lot of flashbacks and moving around in time, that was the moment at which I knew, okay, I think I can do this now. And were you able to keep a lot of your original material? Was it a matter of cutting and reorganizing or did you find you had to generate a lot more new writing? Uh, both, actually, I had to do both. Um, there was a lot I could salvage, but it, I couldn't salvage it in the same uh, way it appeared originally. It, it moved all over the place. Um, you know, things that were together in one essay had to, you know, had to go 12 different places in the final uh, manuscript that I wrote, rewrote. And so I, I wrote a lot of connective material, a lot of new material. And, you know, that's another um, way in which uh, I had an advantage because I had been writing so many short pieces that had gotten published and so many short pieces that hadn't gotten published. Plus, I was keeping um, notebooks on the topic with additional thoughts and ideas and themes that I might develop should I eventually write this memoir. And so I had all of that to go back to. I, it was, you know, inventory, kindling, so to speak, which you can accumulate when you're taking your time working toward that book manuscript. I had so much to go back to and, and uh, incorporate that I might not have had, I, I certainly wouldn't have had, had I just sat down and said, okay, I'm going to bang this manuscript out in a year. I don't think you would have had the same book at all. And I'm guessing that now that you've taken yourself through that challenge, which sounds difficult, but also incredibly exciting as an artist and intellectually exciting as well, that you feel like now you have the book you were meant to write, that you wanted to write? I hope so. <laughs> I'll find out. So I wonder if we could talk as you're going along, because so much of writing is alone. You know, we're in our minds, we're at our keyboards, we're grabbing our notebooks. 
and it can get lonely sometimes. And I wonder if you found that there is value in a writing community and if you have one and how you created it. And do you feel that that's important to all writers? I definitely think that a writing community is a huge, huge asset, particularly when you're making your way slowly toward a big, big writing goal. Mm -hmm. um, because first of all, you need comrades, you need people to cheer you on. You want someone, you want to say to someone, hey, guess what? I finally finished chapter six. And for them to say, yay, good for you, and not have them say, huh, you're only on chapter six. I thought you had to write 20 chapters. <laughs> so all the other writers can relate to that. And it's a wonderful, wonderful boon if you have that. Now, not everybody's going to have the same um, ability to find and build writer communities, maybe physically in person where they live. Um, but there's so many opportunities online and also that grow out of if you go to a conference or you go to a writing retreat or some kind of an educational couple of days somewhere, you're going to meet people there and they can become for you a source of uh, writing support and community if you can keep in touch with them once you get home. And I've seen people do this very purposefully, you know, say, as soon as they get home, I'm going to email these five people and say, hey, I thought we really clicked and I'm working on this. And would you, you know, feel comfortable exchanging work or just get batting around ideas and brainstorming or just venting the frustration? Mm -hmm. um, so I have like several different writer communities that all serve like a different purpose. Uh, when I went back to graduate school to do an MFA uh, at Stone Coast at University of Southern Maine, that was 10 years ago, and I'm still in touch with probably seven or eight of my classmates. And we exchange work, or you know, some of them helped me title my book last year. Uh, just, you know, we meet up at conferences sometimes, uh, usually not on purpose, but we're just happen to be there. But so that's one community, and we share, um, you know, we've been exposed to the same mentors and, and the same program. And then where I live in New Jersey, I happen to be very lucky. I live in a very populated area, which is overrun with writers and other people who work in media and, and journalism. We're right outside New York City. And so I had, there's tons of opportunities. There's all kinds of writing organizations. I teach with a local writing organization and there's hundreds and hundreds of students there who all make their own little communities too as, as they go through the program. So, uh, however, I do sympathize and understand writers who don't have that advantage um, because like as a coach, I am in contact with people from all over the world and you might live in a rural place, you might live in a place where not that many people speak your language, but I will tell you one thing that I've really observed to be true is that there are probably people around who would be interested in coming together to form a writing group if you just start talking about it. I've had people say, oh, I live up in the hills of Montana and there's nobody around. And we start brainstorming and, you know, they decide, oh, I'm going to put a little notice up on the bulletin board at that community center where we all go once a month or whatever. And lo and behold, they started finding people. And maybe you can't see each other in person all the time, but they can get together once in a while. It only takes two people to sit in your living room and boom, you've got a writer's group. Uh, so I really encourage people to try and find something. And if you can't find it, create it. I had the exact same experience. Um, when I finished my graduate program, my MFA 20 years ago, um, I formed enduring bonds with several of the writers in it. And now, we, just like you, we continue to exchange work. We cheer each other on. We see each other at conferences. And we also, every year, arrange a, a little mini retreat where we meet up. They're in different parts of the country. And we pick a place, and we all go. And if we can squeeze out a whole week, we do it. Um, and we have dinners together, and then we share our work and read it aloud. It's, it's absolutely wonderful. And I find that. Um, that is one writing community among many. 
And uh, students in the MFA program I direct are starting to do the same thing. And nothing gives me more pleasure than to seeing them form those relationships, knowing that just having one person waiting for your work saying, hey, what about that essay you were working on? Did you finish it? Can I take a look? One person who's invested in that and whom, with whom you're invested makes all the difference. Um, Lisa, I wanted to ask you also, you have published quite a bit. Um, it seems sometimes that you're having a new piece coming out every week, um, and we love it. And I'm wondering if you, if you felt that that was a big piece of finding a publisher for your work, um, did getting your work out there and getting a lot of clips, even if it wasn't related to your memoir, some of these shorter pieces, was that a big piece of it for you? Or did it just have to do with building confidence as a writer? Well, both. I mean, I think it helps you build, you know, what I would call chops. Uh, the more you write, the more different forms you start, try, the different styles you try, lengths, uh, different, you're exposed to different editors, you learn to work. With, this is the great thing about writing a lot of short pieces. You get to work with so many different editors and you learn how to write to their word count, how to adjust what if you need to for their reading audience. And just to, sometimes you just get a great, great editor. And when you get your marked up copy back from that editor, just study it. And it's, it's like a lesson and, and the bulbs go off and you see, ah, and they have those jobs for a reason. Those, they're editors for a reason. So it's such great experience to get exposed to lots of different editors before you get to the point where you have one editor for your whole book. So you develop a lot of experience about how to deal with the editorial process. Um, I don't, I guess you'd have to ask my publisher whether um, my track record of publication had anything to do with why they made me the offer. I tend to think not, um, mm -hmm. only in the sense that it, I mean, it was not an, uh, it was not a clear path that way. Like some people will tell you the story and this is true. This happens to some people where they publish something in like one of those uh, magazines you have there in the picture right now. And an agent comes to them, an agent approaches them and say, Hey, I, I read your piece in the Paris review. And do you have more on this topic? Or do you have a book manuscript in the works? I'd like to talk about representing you. So that, that does happen not as often as we hope it would, but it, that does happen. That is not what happened to me. In my case, I, um, I actually met the director of the University of Nevada Press at a conference and we started talking. He was interested in my manuscript because my memoir takes place half in Las Vegas and University of Nevada Press has a mandate to publish works that, um, uh, Study that are about the culture of the American Southwest and people who live there. So he had a natural interest because of his, who he works for, his press. And then he got the manuscript and made the offer. So now in the interim, did he go check me out and make sure that, you know, this was someone who had published a lot? Maybe, I don't know. But where it helps you is after too, when it's time to start to look for support and publicity for your book it really helps to be able to go back to all those editors that you've met along the way, who maybe now have moved on to different jobs and different responsibilities. It's great to be able to go back to all of them and say, hey, remember you published my you know, essay or my short story three years ago? Well, now I have a book coming out. Do you think maybe you could review it or would you like to do an interview? That's been very helpful to me. That is very interesting. So that's the after the fact part of it that I think sometimes writers might not think about, but how useful it is when you start publishing work to develop a readership, you know, people who start to know your work and then are invested in you and interested in your book when it comes out. And, it's and it also is true yeah. that um, some, I have also heard enough times to know that it's not just anecdotal, that it is true that publishers do like to see that you've gotten some parts of something published. So if you're coming to them with a short story collection or a novel or a memoir, and you can say, oh, by the way, and you know, part of chapter two was published here and this essay or this short story was published there. I think that does give publishers some confidence 
that you know you know what you're doing and you know how to work with with an editor now some of the work that you publish is not connected to your memoir you've published on many many topics as you were alluding to earlier um, I've read some beautiful pieces by you um, the one on your postpartum depression and on a number of other things and I'm wondering did you find that useful in terms of completing your memoir to take a break and write about other things did it refresh you in some way? Did it help you? Did it take your focus away? Um, do you always have to just keep your focus 100% on the same project? Or is it good to sometimes put it down and, and just dash off an essay? What did you find? All of that. Um, I think it's great to have a release valve. You know, if you're putting a lot of pressure on yourself to finish some big writing project, whether that's a book manuscript or a play or whatever it is that you are so focused on and it's your goal and you just want to get it done and you're devoting all these hours and you're sacrificing, you know, different things that you could be spending your time on. I think it's great to get away from it a little bit. And, and this is sort of ironic because, well, if you only have a certain amount of time, shouldn't you be spending it just on the main project? But if that's all you do and the goal is always very, very, very far away, um, for me, just the way I'm put together mentally, I think I would have gotten a lot more discouraged. To me, it was wonderful to take a little break and write about something else. And, oh, look, I got that published and that feels good. And you know, we all well, look writers like our byline. So we like to see ourselves get published and it, it helped with confidence and it gave me a mental break. And, you know, I was writing about grief. Mm -hmm. And so it was, <laughs> this is going to sound ironic to you. It wasn't fun to go write about postpartum <laughs> depression, so to speak, but there were some other things I wrote about past boyfriends or th other things I wrote about that was like, oh, good, that's a relief. It's, <laughs> I don't have to write about grief today. Yep, I know exactly what you mean. I, I have an essay coming out um, this summer. It's, it's a long, long 25-page essay. It's coming out in um, Creative Nonfiction's um, True Story. And oh. it, that particular one, it's also about grief and about my mother and it. It took me a grand total of three years from beginning to end. And same thing, I had to keep putting it down and go work on other things and finish a couple plays, write some more essays. So I find that, yeah, um, when it comes to something like that, it can be really useful um, to put it down a little bit um, and let it marinate and go off, write about something else. Because, you know, we thinking, we're complicated creatures. We're not just thinking about one thing at a time. We have many interests and preoccupations that we need to talk about and write about. Um, so we're gonna be opening it up to questions in a few minutes. So I wanna, I wanna sneak in my last couple of questions before that. And I'm wondering okay. if you would say, if there's one thing that a writer can do to keep her faith or his faith, the single most important thing, knowing that a project is going to take years, um, we've covered a lot. What would you say it is? Well, first of all, I would say accept that it's going to take a really long time. Um, do a little more, um, get a little more curious about authors and how long it takes them to get their projects done. Find out, read, talk to other authors. Once you have it in your head that, you know what, it might take me five or six years, accept that and adapt to that. And don't put any pressure on yourself to make it go any faster than that. I think most, most writers are somewhat taken aback when they hear how long books take. And that's just not even the writing. I mean, there's first of all, there's all the time it takes to write and revise and polish. And then there's the whole production process, which could go on. Usually it's about 18 months, sometimes a little longer from the moment a publisher says, yes, we want to publish. So I think you have to adopt, adapt a mindset of this is going to take years and that's okay. And to me, that takes a lot of pressure off. Now, in the interim, it's great to set goals. This is the other end of it. Set some goals. 
make them realistic so that you can meet them. You know, X number of pages a month, X number of words a week, X, you know, number of chapters every season or something like that. I find seasonal time markers are really great, especially if you have children in school or by the time school starts or by the time this vacation comes along or something like that. Um, so so have, have a mindset of both. It's going to take a long time and that's okay. And how can I chop this up so that I have some interim goals to strive for that are actually attainable? Be kind to yourself. I couldn't agree with you more. One of the things that I might add to that in terms of the being kind to yourself, accepting, is to really let yourself enjoy it, every minute of it. It's a privilege and a pleasure to create and to write and to build in little mini celebrations for yourself. I find that I like to do that if I've finished a chapter or I've finished a long essay that was really difficult. I'll do something really nice. I'll build it in. I might go out to dinner. I might have a little reading with friends. I might have a glass of champagne, whatever it is. Um, and that too, having that a kind of a, a marker to say, okay, I did this. I achieved this much and now keep going can help in the long, long run. Yeah, I mean, one thing I, one thing I say to so many of the writers I work with is um, you're writing to enhance your life. You don't have, most of us don't have a contract, don't have a deadline from a publisher in the beginning. So it should be an enjoyable endeavor. You're writing because you love to write. So make it, keep it enjoyable. Hmm. I agree with you. You're writing to enhance your life and it is an enhancement. And even the hard, hard work is an enhancement when you're truly engaged in it and it's what you want to be doing. Um, and I you know, we, we talked about all these ways to write in short blocks of time, but I'll also just very quickly say, if you can ever finagle a way to get some time to yourself, <laughs> by all means, do it. You know, if it's an extra day at the end of a business trip and you can find a way to take it, take it. Any way you can get that day, that weekend, whatever, grab it. I have a friend who just checks herself into a hotel. Um, for an overnight. I know not everybody can do that, but there are lots and lots of creative ways to grab a little extra time for yourself. And it's important to know that um, the writing is worth it and that what you have to say is worth it. And that kind of gets back to giving yourself permission in the beginning that we were talking about and uh, not rejecting anything out of hand, but accepting that what you have to say matters. I wonder now, before we open it up to questions, if you would ask, answer this last question I have, which is, how does it feel now to be getting ready to share your book with the world? It's about to be released. Um, what are your hopes? Do you have an ideal reader, uh, mini readers? Oh my goodness. Well, I, th I think the ideal reader is are women over the age of 35 um, and, in, and, and baby boomers of any gender. Uh, people who've experienced loss who, or who are curious about loss, who fear coming losses, you know, losing parents at one point, or if you've lost a parent or anyone close to you, I think that's the ideal reader. Um, I, I don't know how to answer the rest of that question about how do I feel. I'm really tired already because <laughs> there's so much to do to get ready for the launch. And I just hope it goes well. I, I don't know. I'm, I'm going into it with an open mind. Well, I know that uh, there are many of us here who absolutely cannot wait to read it and to hear you read from it. And I know that you have a book tour coming up. And I, I think I made a slide with your schedule. So maybe we could just take a quick look at that, Cheryl, and see all the places that you're going to be visiting. Look at this. Oh, thank you. Oh, I appreciate that. <laughs> I love, and if anybody who's here, who's listening to us right now comes to any of these events, please come tell me that you heard me. I'd love to talk to you. Can I ask you, did you have, did you organize most of this yourself? Was this done in collaboration with a publicist, with your publisher? I did that myself. When you're with a small publisher, um, as, as much as they want to help you and they try to, and their, their resources are limited, so 
this I did myself with friend. I mean, you know, friends helped me who would, you know, appear with me at a certain place or whatever, but we'll see how it goes. It's remarkable. It's absolutely remarkable. And yes, I think that tends to be par for the course, even for um, those with somewhat larger publishers. This is what writers end up doing. And um, it's worth part of the it. job. Part of the job. Exactly. Lisa, we now have time to open it up to questions okay. from listeners. And I would love to hear what um, people want to know, where they want to follow up. So Cheryl, any questions coming in? Great. Thank you so much. We do have a couple of questions. Let me scroll up here. So from Crystal, how do you combat writer's block when trying to write a book? Well, I don't, say, I don't want to say I don't believe in writer's block because we all get stuck at certain points for whatever reason. Um, but I try to just do something else that will help the manuscript. You know, if I can't figure out how to write my way through whatever um, part I'm at, I'll go do something else. I'll go do some research. I'll go read a book that I think is going to help me write the rest of that particular section. And one way or another, it usually leads me back to the page. Great. Where would I locate a writing retreat? Oh, there's so many wonderful sources. Oh, uh, and, most, and most of them you can um, get to for free online. If you look over at um, Poets and Writers website, if you look at the um, Council for Literary Magazines and Presses, if you look at uh, the Writers Chronicle, that one might not be free, that might be behind a paywall. Um, but there's so many sources online. And if you just type in writers retreats into Google, you'll start coming up with lots and lots. There's a, a website, an organization, let me see if I can get it right. It's something like the Alliance for Artists Retreats or something like that. And they have a very comprehensive website with all these different retreats listed. Some you pay to go to, some you don't pay at all, some pay you, <laughs> it's all different um, options and models. So if you just start one, down one of those paths, if you start at one of those places, you'll start leading to others and others. And then if you pick up some uh, magazines at a newsstand, the Writer Magazine, Writer's Digest Magazine, uh, Poets and Writers, you'll see all the ads and listings for them. I also want to add that the topic of our most recent webinar before uh, this one with Lisa happened to be on writing residencies and retreats. And we have a recording of that. So if you like, um, we can send that to you. And the last slide has um, the URLs of numerous websites of some of the retreats and residencies that you can look into and just a whole bunch of resources for you including um, a link to information about our retreat that the MFA runs in Ireland. Every year we have a summer retreat on the west coast of Ireland in Dingle, and that runs the first week in August. And we've got a great lineup this year, including Ann Moore and Dinty Hood and Suzanne and Tom Shea. So we really look forward to that. But if you can't get to Ireland, there are many other options. And also, I'll just toss in, you can put your own retreat together. You know, grab two or three other writers, find a bed and breakfast somewhere in the off season. Like if it's a ski resort, go in the summer and you can usually, or you can rent a place on Airbnb or something like that. You can put these together yourself if you want to. Absolutely. In fact, one of our MFA faculty members, Susan Ito, who teaches generational histories, writing about family and the contemporary women's story, wrote an article for uh, Writer Magazine about exactly how to do that, how to organize your own retreat. And uh, it's in the archives if you look for it online. So I recommend doing that as well. Great. We do have um, quite a, uh, some additional questions, quite a large number of additional questions. Not sure if we'll have time to get to all of them, uh, but we'll uh, start reading them. What are the steps you took to find an editor? Where did you look? 
Um, so I didn't have, uh, I guess this question must mean an editor before I submitted the manuscript to a publisher. And I didn't hire an editor in that traditional sense because I had so many um, beta readers who were very high level uh, writers and authors and, and faculty members who would read for me. And I got their feedback, which is the equivalent really of getting an editor's feedback. So that's the way I handled it. Excellent, thank you. Next question from Michelle. My father wants me to write about him. What is the best way to start? Great question. <laughs> well, I, I think the first thing I would consider is, do you want to? <laughs> <laughs> so I'm not sure if whether that means he wants you to write his memoir. Like He has a lot of great stories from his life that he wants you to get down for him or whether it's a collaborative project. So maybe the first thing I would say is to try and figure out what are you writing and why and that might help you decide whether you want to go on with the project and how you would set it up it sounds to me like a great opportunity for oral family history uh, i would definitely record it do a lot of interviews with dad you'll hear his voice and his pacing and you'll have that forever and you can write that will help you write the material and it could be something wonderful to do together. Uh, I would set up actual interviews where, you know, Dad, I'm coming over and we're going to talk for two hours. And this the topic of this conversation is going to be your military service. And when we meet, you know, three days from now, the topic is going to be, you know, your early family. So that Dad has a chance then, too, to get his thoughts in order. And I would look for photographs and um, other documents that uh, come with his history and have them available while you're talking because those are great memory triggers. Mm. Really good suggestion, Lisa. Great. Next question from Maria. I know I want to write a book. I'm understanding what it will take to complete the book. The biggest question I have is how to find a publisher or go about researching a publisher and what is the initial cost, if any? Well, there shouldn't be any cost, first of all. If you run into anybody who says, I will find you a publisher, all you have to do is pay me X amount of dollars, please run the other way. So, Absolutely. I would say, and I know that this is hard to take, but first write a really, really great manuscript. That's the first thing. Because you can find the publishers when you're ready. Um, so spend the time right, getting your writing as highly polished and high quality as it could possibly be. Get all the best feedback and editing that you need. And then when it's time to find publishers, there's so many great resources that you can plumb online that are very reputable so you won't lead yourself astray. Uh, and whether you decide that you're going to first seek an agent or if you decide you're going to go straight to smaller publishers and university presses that will work with writers who don't have agents, that's the time then to really go all out on the research and to find them. One really quick fun trick, by the way, while you're proceeding to write your book, while you're reading other books, books you love, open up and find out who publishes them. You know, it's right there on the front first couple of pages and then go research that publisher online and almost all publishers on their website will have a section that says, here's how you submit your work to us. Great, Good. thank you. Okay, next question. How difficult is it to get published? It's very difficult. Um, but you only need one to say yes. So what you're looking for is the right match. And it might take you 30 publishers and six months to find the right match. Or it may take you two weeks and two publishers. So much depends on timing and on your research, targeting the right ones to approach, because you could waste an awful lot of time approaching the wrong type of publisher for your kind of book. 
the research really matters and and so does not giving up you know relevant to the topic of this marlon james who ended up winning was it the national book award lisa or the pulitzer um i think it was the book award and the man booker prize and the man booker prize was rejected 37 Pardon. times by 37 publishers before he found the right one and then it became a phenomenon and won prizes so like lisa says all you need is one and as long as it's the right one and don't give up on that yeah and same goes for agent if you're shopping for an agent same thing you just need one the right one and then that agent is going to go find you the right publisher and sometimes it takes a month sometimes it takes two years Thank you. And do you recommend self-publishing? Hmm. I think self-publishing has a place. I think if you're if you're very established in your field and you do a whole lot of speaking engagements and speaking at conferences and other industry events and you're well known and maybe you have a great website, self-publishing might make sense because you can probably sell thousands of books at your events and from your website. Um, and a lot of that falls into specialty kinds of books, uh, you know, how to grow tulips if you're a master gardener or something like that. Um, I think it's great for family histories where people are only interested in having enough books to give to every extended family member. Um, I don't think it's the greatest path if you're hoping to make a career out of being a published author. Um, and there's a lot uh, Here's the, here's the downside of self-publishing, the biggest downside. You pay out this money, you wind up with a bunch of boxes of books in your garage or attic, and then you don't know what to do with them because there's no marketing follow-through. So it's very difficult for someone who's, that, who's spent that money, and, and it might not be as high quality, as you know, well-edited as it would be. So I always say, look, first you want to try traditional publishing. Because you can always self-publish later at the end if you decide, okay, look, it's not going to work the traditional way. I want to do it that way. Mm -hmm. Great. And one more question. How do you keep all of your pieces of writing organized and stored? Uh, well, I'm old, so I print things out. <laughs> um, well, first of all, just have a system within your computer. You know, everything goes in its own electronic folder, and then every single draft gets its own file name. And I keep all the drafts. So, you know, let's say I'm writing uh, a story about trip to Mexico. So it's going to say trip to Mexico, draft number one, April 23rd, 2018. And then the next one's going to say trip to Mexico, draft number two, May 10th, 2018. I keep the title and I keep the draft number and I keep the date in the electronic file name. And that helps me so much. And then I print stuff out. I, I'm a big believer in printing stuff out, engaging with your work on paper. I do the exact same thing. And in fact, I took an editing workshop once in which um, it was a professional editor who gave the workshop. And what he said is that the eye looks differently at words on the printed page than it does on the screen anyway. And so it's always important when looking at another draft of a work to have a printed copy of it. So, and then you just want to be able to know how to get, go find it. If anything happens to your laptop, you want that. Yeah, I once had a, a mentor who said, other people go by manicures and pedicures and cds and jewelry and things like that but we're writers we buy ink and paper <laughs> that's it and books i will always spend money on and books, books. <laughs> um do we have i know we're going just a tiny bit over there's one more question that came in over the transom um, by email and i just happened to see it someone who was uh lost the window but couldn't still hear us and wanted to ask you lisa about your thoughts of flash nonfiction being all the rage now. Um, why it's such great interest now, and are there any benefits of trying it out? Have you done that yourself? Yeah, I've bunch. I, yeah, excuse me. I've published a bunch of flash nonfiction pieces, 
And by the way, flash in nonfiction is usually shorter than flash fiction. Flash in nonfiction, the generally agreed upon length is usually about 750 words. Whereas when you talk of flash fiction, it's all over the place. Some people talk of flash fiction as up to 2000 or 2500 words. So flash nonfiction generally is 750, but there's also shorter versions too. And I've, I've done some shorter pieces. I like it. I find it fun. It's very challenging. It's so much harder than writing long because you, every word has to do more work. And I think it's a great, great way to develop, um, you know, more writing skill. If you can say it in 750 words or 500 words, um, that you've you've done so much for your writing muscle, and you you've gotten a new way and uh, of expressing it. And I think it's I have a lot of fun with it. Why it's the rage, I don't know, but I'm riding it. I like it. I would guess mobile devices. Yeah, something you, know, you can read on one screen. Yep, yeah. you can whip out your your phone and and click on a link and read it quickly. And I I find myself doing that sometimes when I have a couple minutes, um, just get a little literary refreshment. So Lisa, thank you so very much for this wonderful, fascinating discussion. It's such a pleasure talking to you. Um, I do want to encourage our listeners to please go out and order that book. Um, I can't wait to read it. I have a feeling you're feeling the same way. And see if you can catch Lisa at um, one of her tour stops. She's going to be all over. And you'll also get a copy of this uh, webinar with the PowerPoint slides. So you'll be able to go back and refer to that. And a last thought that if any of you are interested in the MFA in which Lisa teaches, you would have the opportunity to work with her as a thesis director. And I am always happy to answer questions and talk more about our program. Um, all my contact information is on the website. So um, get in touch. I'd love to talk to you. Last thoughts, Lisa? Thank you so much for this opportunity. I really, really appreciate all your kind words about my book and my work. And I hope that what we talked about was helpful to our listeners. And I'd also invite people, if you want to um, go over to my website, which is very easy, lisaromeo.net. Uh, there's a, a tab called Connect. And if you want to ask me something you didn't get a chance to ask here, I'd be happy to chat with you that way, too. And good luck to everyone on your work. Yes. Um, echo that. Good luck. Keep writing. Don't give up. Thanks, everybody. Okay. Bye. Thank you, everyone, for being here today and taking time out of your busy schedules. Have a wonderful day. Bye. Bye, Liana. Bye, Lisa.